The last 13 years has witnessed a series of shocks, starting with the 2008 financial crash, the emergence of right-wing populists taking power, the rise of China, and most recently, the COVID pandemic, all of which mark the end of an era of political and economic orthodoxy. But what precisely has changed and what are the rules and opportunities of the game in 2021? Joining me to discuss that today is Paolo Gibaldo, a sociologist and author of a new book out with Verso Books titled The Great Recoil. Paolo, welcome to Downstream. Hi, Aaron, and hi, everyone. Uh, it's uh, it's great to have you um, down the line talking about these issues. We're talking, I think it's important to say this, before Labour Party conference. This will be coming out after Labour Party conference. Uh, so if anything is wrong, you know why. The, the discussions we're having, this book in particular, I think is really salient to so many conversations we're going to hear from mainstream politics over the next couple of years. So I'm really happy we could discuss it. You, you start with the book um, saying that neoliberalism is dead. Um, obviously, we've heard that multiple times before. Why, in your opinion, in The Great Recoil, is neoliberalism incapable of carrying on as before? And what's the role of COVID-19 in that? The key thing in the book is that neoliberalism is understood not just as an ideology, but as a bipartisan consensus that defined a political era. Right? The era started in the 80s, obviously with Thatcher and Reagan, but then uh, progressively permeating also the center left, obviously Clinton, Blair, Schroeder, and so on and so forth. And there is a tendency in history where you have these periods of 40, 50 years where a certain consensus is dominant that then inevitably kind of fade away and uh, open the space for a new consensus to emerge. I mean, before neoliberalism, we had social democracy, obviously, right in the post-war period, the so-called the so Trant Glorieuse, the period of most uh, intense uh, uh, and prosperous expansion of capitalism. And then the neoliberal era, I mean, the very talking about the neoliberal era uh, implies that at some point that era was going to end. And indeed, we've heard about the end of neoliberalism in the aftermath of 2008, then more recently Stiglitz. And now many people in a way are uh, um, joining these, these theses. I mean, Adam Tooze, uh, for example, in his last book. And I think in 2021, there's more reason to say that neoliberalism is fading because we have been through the 2010s, which have been a period of prolonged economic stagnation, where the recipes of neoliberal economists have evidently failed, and has been a period of populist insurgencies, right, of the most different kind. I mean, protest movements, Gilets jaunes, Occupy, uh, contesting neoliberalism from the streets, new uh, left populist candidates and parties, obviously Corbyn, Sanders, and then the populist right. And what unites all this phenomena was criticism of different aspects of neoliberalism. I mean, I think that many um, opinion polls that point to a change in attitudes among citizens uh, highlight that the common sense of neoliberalism, namely this idea that the market is good, the state is bad, is now really uh, going away from the center. I mean, you have still neoliberals around, but they're becoming more radicalized precisely as befits a phase where uh, their views, their beliefs are not common sense anymore, but become partisan one again, once again. Yeah, that's so true. The point about uh, the role of the state in particular, and we'll, we'll return to that. Uh, and of course, COVID-19 really, really pressed home, actually, just how fond many people are of the state to solve mm -hmm. big problems. So if I'm understanding what you just said correctly, Paolo, because of course, many of our listeners, our viewers have heard this so many times. They've you know, heard the words, neoliberalism is over, whether it was 2008 mm -hmm. with the crisis, uh, whether it was the IMF saying something, whether it was quantitative easing going on for 10 years, this is clearly not how optimal markets function, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is the economic orthodoxy has been falling apart and hey, it may carry on for a bit longer, but the political aspect of how states seek to coordinate things, the consensus among politicians and the media, mm -hmm. that has definitively gone. So there are two separate parts of the, the sort of question. Is that, is, that, is that what you're saying? That's correct. I mean, there's obviously two levels, right? I mean, there is a symbolic level or discursive level to politics. I mean, the slogans that are used, the catchwords that are used, the kind of discourse politi politicians are using. In that regard, we can say that neoliberals were clearly against the state. I mean, rolling back the state, um, Reagan, Thatcher, and so on and so forth. And policy-wise, uh, they also, I mean, while many people say, no, but it's not true that neoliberalism was against the state. <clears throat> In fact, if you look at public spending as a percentage of GDP, clearly 
Margaret Thatcher reduced state spending as a percent of GDP. Uh, Ronald Reagan, despite uh, the Star Wars, right, and the Cold War with, with Russia, uh, also reduced state spending in significant areas, I mean, in education, in health, in social welfare. And then you have another um, breed of neoliberalism, which is the sort of uh, third way breed of neoliberalism. And Tony Blair increased state spending, but mostly uh, through uh, private uh, and public partnership, through ways that in a, in, instead of uh, uh, emboldening the state, uh, were designed to support the city, to support finance. And while at the same time demolishing many aspects of the welfare state. I mean, that is also what Clinton did. Actually, Clinton did more to destroy the US welfare state than even Reagan did. Right? Uh, now, it's important to distinguish neoliberalism and capitalism. Right? I mean, I think that now, having been immersed, being uh, Blair children or Blair babies, right? I mean, many of the of uh, the older people like listening, right? In a sense, people who have been brought up through neoliberalism, we have come to equate neoliberalism and capitalism as if they were the same things. But that is not the case. I mean, capitalism is uh, uh, multifaceted, it is polymorphous, it is extremely adaptable. It has been around for 500 years and it has associated itself with very different regimes of accumulation, right? I mean, Genoese capitalism in uh, the Renaissance, right, is, <laughs> was very different from the one existing now. We had more organized form of capitalism. We had more statist form of capitalism. Uh, in China, they are actually going back to state capitalism full on with the state owning basically 60% of the economy. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> the important caveat there is that the end of neoliberalism doesn't at all mean a socialism as an automatic option or b uh, the end of capitalism in, in any way or form it's more a transformation of the very logic of capitalism because even capitalists themselves in a way are are starting to salvage neoliberalism because it doesn't work for them either right i mean a stagnating economy stagnated demand certain sections of capital at least have smelled the coffee and are now more open to a more interventionist state. So as this unfolds, um, how is it playing out between the right, left and the centre? Has the right understood that this great recoil is happening more quickly than the left? Is the centre the least likely of all three sort of political blocks to adapt? And, and as you talk about that, can you maybe introduce some actual uh, examples, you know, Biden, Trump, Boris Johnson, Keir Starmer, Jeremy Corbyn, perhaps. Yes, I mean, a key part of the book is really charting uh, the political space because of the, my impression, I think the impression of many people that there's been a lot of confusion in recent years. I mean, this neither left nor right kind of mm. discourse, uh, this sense that somehow uh, political space is inverted with the right representing the working class and the left representing the middle class. We also people like Piketty making observations to that uh, in, in that sense. And what I wanted to point out was that the populist moment of the 2010s was not a moment of union of the extreme left and the extreme right. I mean, sometimes the phenomenon of populism is understood. Instead, is is like a pyramid, right, where uh, there is a polarization at the, ba at the base of the pyramid. Uh, populism was more uh, a change in society, a change in conditions where at a time of socioeconomic decline, uh, it was more strategic to appeal to the lower middle class and to the impoverished working class rather than to the aspirational middle class, right, of, of uh, previous decades uh, of the neoliberal era. So what it means is that you have had a radicalization both at the right and at the left. I mean, on the right, you have a, a recuperation of nationalist themes and motives that for uh, many years, right, were not around or were in much more watered down form. And conversely, on the left, you have had, during the 2010s, the recuperation of overtly socialist motifs. I mean, I'd say more social, social democratic and socialist motifs. And uh, in this context, the center is, in a way, the, is also an important adversary. I mean, th that's another point of, of this chart, in a sense that one thing is the nationalist right, but then you have a neoliberal center, which also extends into the right and the left, and is now, in a way, the most conservative force in a sense, is the one that is trying to push back 
all these attempts to moderately redirection economic policy in a more progressive direction. I mean, let's make the case of Biden. I mean, A, I think me, you, Aaron, I don't know if you uh, agree with that, many other people were really surprised by uh, the kind of the, the, the swing to the left. I mean, the change of, of political direction of Biden, we didn't expect that. But that bespeaks precisely this rearrangement of common sense, in a sense that uh, liberal elite, a part of the, of the center, has decided to uh, discard uh, neoliberalism and um and bet for something new a more progressive liberalism a liberalism more more focus on um internal demand domestic demand um, uh, marginally uh, improving workers conditions right but now biden right is facing uh, as we are seeing now right in congress i mean i think he's on the 27th of september that they need to mm. finally vote on their conciliation bill you have people like christian cinema and joe manchin who are stubbornly trying to block uh, this change, right? I mean, because they're really defending the old neoliberal consensus uh, and they, they're getting so rushed on Twitter for that. I mean, really, it's clear the public opinion is against them, yet they are defending them because, you know, they are bankrolled, right? By the corporations who don't want this change, oil corporations, uh, uh, banking, and so on and so forth. The right, has the right been quicker than, than the left? I think it has because already in the 2010s, it was rearranged in its agenda in a post-neoliberal direction. Um, a, um, criticizing global trade. I mean, in a way, it has stolen anti-globalization from the left, if Absolutely. you think about it. Yes. yes. So while it was the left in the, around the turn of the millennium that developed a critique of uh, globalization, of global trade, in the 2010s, it was the right that went full on for that. Yeah. Right? yeah. While at the same time, maintaining low taxation policies internally a kind of darwinist outlook on how the economy works right uh, but one has to give to them that i mean johnson is not the same tory uh, tourism as margaret thatcher it's quite a different one yeah i think uh, there's a few points i want to pick up there the first is biden i'm sure some people watching this or listening in in the states uh, but even in the uk too would think what the hell are you talking about biden is not mm -hmm. on the left that's not what's being said. Mm -hmm. And I don't think this just reflects changes in domestic policy uh, or even rhetoric, right? I mean, there's two levels here. There's the rhetoric, and clearly he's to the left of Barack Obama on, on rhetoric um, in terms of class, in terms of trade union rights, in terms of workers. But in terms of policy, we, we know that's also true. Like I say, even though it's not it's not huge, it's, it's, it's significant. Then I think there's another sort of aspect here, which is, of course, foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to go back that far to just 10 years ago where the likes of David Cameron, George Osborne, Barack Obama, yeah, they have different politics. But in terms of their relationship to China, for instance, they would never dream of escalating a sort of face-off because of geopolitics, uh, technological rivalry, and so on. And, and clearly that's changed. Biden is a huge jump from Obama in that respect. And I think that that has consequences both for domestic but also global politics, because like you say, the Great Recoil has meant the rules of the game have, have substantially changed. Um, and then the thing about Boris Johnson and, and, and Margaret Thatcher, I mean, I find this indisputable. And I think that's why Brexit, when it happened, because, of course, the, the arguments to leave the European Union have been around since Britain joined the European Union. Labour, you know, had a manifesto in the 80s to leave the EU. It wasn't called the EU then. It was called the European Economic Community, the EEC. Mm -hmm. uh, and there has, of course, been really strong Euroscepticism amongst Tories really since the Maastricht Treaty of, of the early 1990s. But the timing of it, is just extraordinarily fortunate for British conservatism, I think. Uh, because what it did, you're quite right, it allowed the right to take the clothing of anti-globalization away from the left. And I remember in the, sort of the weeks and the months running up to the vote, you had progressives defending the European Central Bank and also talking about you know, the IMF and the WTO. And you think, what the hell is happening here, right? <laughs> and I wrote, I wrote a short piece on... On Medium at the time, it's you know a tiny piece. It's still there about you know Bernie Sanders is taking on NAFTA he, rhetorically. Of course, mm -hmm. he was running for the Democratic nomination at that time. Um, he's taking on NAFTA. He's taking on you know he says the fundamental rules of global trade need to change mm -hmm. because that edifice is collapsing. It's going, and I don't think the left in this country understood that, um, which is a tragedy. And I I think they tied themselves to a consensus which was literally never going to stabilize or stick around, 
which allowed, within a few years, as we're now seeing, the Conservative Party to present themselves as the face of, of, of economic change. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Yes, completely. I think, A, there was a tendency among many leftists to take globalization as a value unto itself, as related to a culture of cosmopolitanism, openness, and not to be able to unpack what globalization is about. I mean, obviously, we are all in favor of uh, uh, refugees being protected and people being free to travel, right? but we cannot overlook the way in which many people's livelihood have been threatened by, by globalization, especially people in manufacturing. I mean, it's not that people in manufacturing are voting for the right because they're racist or because, right, I mean, they're retrograde, but because it, it, all data shows that manufacturing has been very exposed to international competition, which has resulted in loss of jobs because of delocation and has resulted in stagnated salaries and so on and so forth. I mean, I think I understand that for the left, especially in the US, it is very difficult to swallow, in a way, Biden's change as being progressive. Uh, because, I mean, we all rooted for uh, Sanders. We all rooted for Corbyn. I mean, we all rooted for democratic socialism. We thought that a far more radical change in political economy and in, in politics in general was necessary. And instead, Santa delivered something else delivered a sort of watered-down social democracy or uh, progressive liberalism. Uh, that is what you're seeing in, in uh, the U.S. with Biden, and it's also what you're seeing with Yespede's revival in Germany. Partly also Trudeau's uh, uh, re-election was very much uh, premised on a more progressive policy platform on uh, salaries and so on and so forth. I mean, so we didn't get the, what we wanted, what we really dreamed in. But at the same time, we should only rejoice at the fact that some pragmatic centrists have realized that this is a, a make or break moment. I mean, why is Biden doing that? Biden is doing that because of the Capitol Hill riots, right? And is the expression of a section of the liberal elite that got really scared on 6th of January 2021. Uh, can I just say, I think as well, I mean, just the Trump experience really put the frightens up, mm. up the American establishment and they, look, mm -hmm. they don't all vote Democrat, right? Um, and I, I, I think that's so, so true. And I think a lot of people looked at that quite soberly and thought, you know what, I I'm willing to pay a little bit more tax. Um, mm -hmm. I'm willing to, to vote for a guy who's also going to have, you know, Ilhan Omar behind them um, and, and uh, AOC. I, I, I don't really mind. This is... This is hugely dangerous to my bottom line. Um, I think. I think. So, you, so you're saying actually Trump recalibrated as a big variable in recalibrating the common sense of of just the, sort of the American liberal establishment, or do you think that also applies more globally? I think that applies definitely um, first and foremost to to, to the U.S. And uh, uh, one really revealing uh, reading for me recently was this Brian Deasy's interview. Brian Deasy is the chief economic advisor of Joe Biden with Ezra Klein who really explain very transparently, I think, I mean, the, the kind of thinking behind uh, the economic, the Bidenomics, fundamentally. And he said that is the result of three fears. So fear one is fear of Trump. They want to avoid a return of Trump. How do you avoid that? By paying workers decently and by providing social support. Because guess what? It is not a cultural war. It is a social war. I mean, right-wing populism feeds on in social injustice, inequality, and neglect of working class communities. B, it is fear of China. It is fear of China, obviously. And also the model of Chinese state capitalism. I mean, in recent days, obviously a bit obfuscated <laughs> by the Evergrande's affair. Uh, but we know that all in all, uh, Chinese capitalism has been far more successful than neoliberal capitalism. And in a way, my sense is that the US wants to become more like China. He wants to have more the state in the driving wheel, um, controlling investment, investment that are still going to be uh, performed, realized by by private industry, but with the state strategizing, mm. right, uh, using industrial policy and, and using deficit deficit spending. Like and 50, finally, 60 years yeah. ago. Yeah, and finally, it is the results of, of, of socialists, I mean, uh, of the press, pressure of socialists in the Democratic Party. I mean, those things have a result. Perhaps it's only the third factor. But still, it uh, widened the Overton window of, of policymaking. Also because I think Biden was, as a pragmatic politician, I mean, he realized that the energy is there among youth. 
So what's the most intelligent way for you to neutralize internal opposition, if you want to put it in a Machiavellian way, is to co-opt it, right? Is to give them uh, posts, is to uh, make use of them, right? Is what the SPD has done, right? Uh, also with um, democratic socialists emerging in the party, uh, like Kevin Kunert. They were undecided whether to expel him in 2019, <laughs> ultimately they gave him the de deputy leadership. And he's a guy for nationalization. He's basically a Corbynista, right? Mm. Uh, which is exactly the opposite. So going back to the Labour Party conference, what Starmer has been doing instead, right? Uh, really staunchly avoiding any talk of uh, redirection or rebalancing, uh, which I think like, is politically stupid. I mean, besides being wrong, I mean, is not really a marker of political intelligence. Can I just draw you quickly on that before we move on? Um, I mean, that does seem to be the big takeaway here. So you're saying that the, the sort of centre-left, where it's succeeding, we're going to talk about pasokification a bit and how it sort of relates to all these questions, but where it is succeeding, and it is in many places, actually, you look at recent elections in Scandinavia, you look at Joe Biden, you look at what's going on now with the SPD in Germany. Again, I think this will come out after the German elections, but they're, they're doing far better than we, we thought six months ago, quite frankly. And where they are performing well, is where, like you say, they recuperate the energies of the left rather than antagonise them and, and take them on. And actually right now, the, the UK Labour Party, and not even the UK Labour Party, because the Welsh Labour Party has done something like that, it's particularly Labour at Westminster in, in the UK, are actually going to war with their left and, and trying to reach out to the centre-right, which is the precise opposite of what these other uh, successful parties have done coming from the centre-left. So on your understanding, do you think that's really a, a hiding to nothing for Keir Starmer? Do you think that, that strategy is is highly likely to fail, given all the evidence we're looking at right now? I mean, I think it is like, I mean, I think also the polls show it, though he has come back a little bit in recent polls. But I mean, the general picture is one where there is no sense of momentum behind this campaign. There is no vision. Um, there is also a huge gap between rhetoric and policy. Now, rhetoric and policy obviously are two different levels, but when you promise something right in your leadership campaign manifesto and deliver exactly the opposite, that means that obviously you're being uh, disingenuous, uh, you're being hypocritical, and that ultimately politicians pay that, pay for that. I mean, you can lie as Plato already advised politicians to do, but only to a certain point. Um, I also think that, I mean, um, really what we are seeing in Bidenism and what we are seeing in SPD's uh, policy is something that, again, is uh, about saving capital, right? Uh, it's about making capital more uh, effective uh, to make it perform better because ultimately intelligent members of the elite have realized that there is a problem with, guess what, with stagnating demand because salaries have been pushed down for decades now. So now, I mean, making small concessions to salaries, making small concessions to wages is actually in the interest of the economy and, and of capitalism as a whole. Uh, Why with Starmer, you basically have, it's almost as if labor is trying to reposition itself as the party of fiscal prudence. Yes, 100%. I mean, he, he said this yesterday in this thing, this think piece in the Fabian Society yesterday, written for the Fabian Society. And then again, you go back to a Peter Mandelson piece today. He's basically saying the Tories' response to, to COVID means that we can be the party of the small state. <laughs> I mean, it's remarkable. And again, given your central hypothesis in this book, I mean, that's totally at odds with the new zeitgeist we're going towards. Yes, I'd say so. I mean, it's in a way as if, uh, I mean, the la labor was always divided between the neoliberal center and the socialist left, and now is really going to uh, siding uh, very strongly with, with ne the neoliberal center. I think that is not the only, at all, the only uh, possible solution. I think that these, obviously, these so-called revival of social democracy is still very much encrusted with many neoliberal elements. Plus, it's really not sure. I mean, I, I'm not predicting anything because, you know, like at the end, the end of September will be decisive because A, we have the German elections and we will see what will happen after the German elections. We still still could get a grosse coalition, not changing much policy in Germany. Same thing with the reconciliation bill. If that is defeated, right, I mean, many of these things uh, we would need to be uh, rediscussed and reconsidered. But if you look at the long term, if you look at changes in attitudes, if you look at Gallup, Ipsos, and all the analysis they conducted, you see A, 
that people are far more in favor now of the state intervening in new areas, that they are demanding protection, that they are demanding security, that they are more well disposed towards trade unions, right? So I think there is a shift, not necessarily towards the left, but towards demands for greater state interventionism. And I think that a center left would be that is more forward-looking would be very well positioned actually to attend those demands. Let's talk about the issue of sovereignty quite quickly. Um, that was obviously a, a, a central uh, narrative within the 2016 Brexit referendum. And it was something that the, the left and Remainers, and I think that obviously those two broadly overlapped, um, really shied away from discussions of sovereignty. They were scared of talking about sovereignty. When Farage talked about sovereignty, they either ignored it or they said he was being ridiculous or they said in the 21st century that no longer exists. Where does sovereignty sit in, in, in your broader analysis of what's going on right now? There's no politics without sovereignty, right? So anybody who says the sovereignty uh, doesn't matter or is a problem in a way is uh, uh, fooling the audience. In a sense, it all depends on where you locate sovereignty. So the very debate about sovereignty it was and is a debate about where should people have power. Ultimately, if you take the term, it means very simply supremacy. I mean, supremacy of the state, of political power over other powers, as it is exercised uh, typically over a territory and a population within the territory. It is a question that for a long time belonged more to academic discussions, right? Jurists or political scientists, diplomats would talk about sovereignty. The fact that now it has become a political issue that ordinary people talk about is precisely because in moments of sudden change, in moments of organic crisis, it is as if you see uh, the moving parts of politics. I mean, things that normally you don't see. So really, in a way, the zero degree of politics, the interiors of politics, so, so to speak, the entrails of politics. And why is it so important now? Uh, because the main... Uh, means of sovereignty in the in the paradigm before globalization was the nation state and with globalization that has been eroded and eroded and weakened to the point where it has become very confused where power lies uh, but in turn the uh, dissatisfaction with globalization has led to a return of the repressed uh, precisely, if you read all the big books of, of uh, neoliberals, sovereignty is always the punch bowl. I mean, they're always attacking sovereignty, they're always attacking control, the state, and so on and so forth. This is not just a myth. I mean, it's really what is written in the canonic texts. And therefore, as it happens at any moment of uh, uh, decline of a given ideology, of a given paradigm, when there is a paradigmatic shift, you tend to see the enemies of the previous paradigm emerging to the front. Then it all depends, it is a very polysemic term, it all depends how you understand sovereignty. You can understand sovereignty as jealous defense of borders, as anti-migrants posture, as defense of an ethno-cultural community, or you can understand it as um, people talking about food sovereignty understand it, or energy sovereignty, how environmentalists talk about sovereignty, namely a recuperation of control over political decisions and, res and economic resources at the local and national level. Yeah, I think, again, that, that, that the left's, the radical, not the left, because many left-wing people don't think on that level. They think the state is actually quite good. But the, uh, you talk about there's a stateophobia elsewhere in mm -hmm. the book where the, the sort of newer left that emerged after the 1960s in particular had an aversion to the state, doesn't think the state can do anything well. And of course, the, the arguments about how that laid the foundations for Thatcherism and Reaganism are well sort of litigated. You can agree or disagree, but I think yeah. it's, clearly a, it's clearly a current which in the present moment with climate change, with COVID-19, with the challenges of demographic aging, with the return of non-European superpowers, the conversation about, you know, the state and what its role is, is obviously a, is obviously a massive one, both for the left and the right. Attendant with that is that is that question of, of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And what I always found really peculiar, Paolo, is mm. that you would talk to sort of Greens, and I said mm. something's a green socialist, mm. or left liberals, and they would say, we need to change globalization, it's terrible, it's not working. Okay, mm -hmm. so what should we do? Should we situate power back within self-governing nation states? Oh no, we can't do that. <laughs> you think, well, where, where does that, okay, well, you don't want the corporate globalization, you don't want nation states to be self-governing and, and to be producing things. 
and you say, well, if we're going to if we're going to reduce carbon emissions and decarbonize the global economy, clearly we're going to have more state production at a national level. No, no, that would be mm. socialism in one country. We can't do that. <laughs> and it's just you know that that whole um, uh, one no, many yeses. Well, actually, it turns out many no's, no yeses. You know that come from the sort of alter globalization currents. And I feel like. Both yeah. the strengths and weaknesses of that account of the global economy coming from the left in the early 21st century are what are both, you know, helping the right and hindering the left. Mm. So the right have understood that actually these mm. people had a really good account of transnational elites, global capital and a, and a democratic deficit. And these things are accurate. And also mm. the time has come politically popular. At the same time, the left's walked away from that and then focused on the bad bits of it. Like, mm -hmm. oh, actually, we should keep globalization. And it's just this incredible volt face. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say the left, again, I'm not talking about Joe Biden or, or Jeremy Corbyn, but, you know, activists more broadly from, the, from, from below, from the radical left. And we saw this in the Brexit referendum, right? If you Completely. even said, if you even said, I'm, like, I'm going on a bit of a rant here, Paolo, we will return to the book. <laughs> if you even said after 2016, I mean, I said it, of course we should re respect the referendum. Of course we should. People say, you're racist. Yeah. You know, what, what level of discussion are we having here? This is unbelievable. So, well, people didn't really know what was going on in the referendum. They weren't properly informed. In what election ever in the history of humanity has everybody been perfectly informed of the facts? Right? Were people, were people properly informed in the 2019 general election about Jeremy Corbyn as a, as a person, as a human being? Of course they weren't. doesn't mean we re rerun the thing. So, uh, Paolo, very quickly, as a, as, a, as a quick aside, you know, statophobia. Is it something uh, where, the left is, yeah. where the left is getting better or is it going to keep on holding it back? I mean, uh, I'm completely on the same page with you, Aaron, on, on this in a sense that, I mean, what I see is that there was a certain strand of anti-authoritarian thought emerging in, in, in the 70s, really. It was very much about the critique of the state and uh, it comprised different movements. Uh, it also had good reasons. I mean, it was a critique of Stalinism. It was a critique of the failures of social democracy. But then it turned into a narcissistic individualism, which is now this individualism of, I want to decide whether to be vaxxed or not vaxxed is my ultimate decision. This cult of choice, right? As if uh, you, uh, the, the most important thing is individual choice. Even when it comes to things that are by their nature collective, they are biological, right? As Benjamin Bratton was also explaining in his book, I mean, it's not, they go beyond you as an individual, really. Um, and also there were figures like nouveau philosophes i mean like people who were maoist and then turned arch liberal and they really pushed this critique of the state on and on which in a way generalized critique of totalitarianism to any form of state inter interventionism where ultimately which was exactly the thesis of neoliberal ultimately the end point of some industrial policy is the gulag right which is obviously ridiculous and that goes on also with uh, a very shallow cosmopolitanism that has become prevalent, uh, especially on the left, um, on the middle class left in, in, in recent years, which is very different from internationalism, right? Which was the standard line of socialists. I mean, the international was organized around national chapters. It was called international because it united the people of the world in fraternity. He didn't want to dissolve them. Yet, yes, I mean, people like Mazzini, who was also involved with, uh, in uh, discussion with socialists, said that at some point in history, the human family will finally, whatever, merge and we will overcome nation. But it was a very kind of distant projection. And indeed, it may well be. It's not that nations will exist forever. Yet, in the short to medium term, <laughs> that's the most fundamental form of uh, political organization that there is. And still, if you do polls, uh, uh, that is wha where people think that legitimacy resides. So all this discussion about global democracy, which obviously is, is completely a kind of Pollyanna dream, right? Uh, you, it's very difficult to understand how it would actually work. Is really a huge distraction from what we can do and actually from the realistic form of international collaboration we can construct, right? Because really we shouldn't go for an autarkic future or isolationist future. Yet at the same time, we need to start from where we are. We cannot start from the sky. We need to start from the ground and we need to leverage the powers that we have, right? We cannot 
think about imaginary kingdoms as as uh, Machiavelli, but real kingdoms as, as they actually exist. Yeah. There's, you know, you often hear this thing and it kind of attends the, the these leftist circles where they, you know, again, where there's this quite shallow cosmopolitanism and people say, mm. there's nothing more dangerous than an idea. It's like, mm. that's just not true. <laughs> there's lots of things more dangerous than an idea. You know what? You know what the elite yeah. hate more than ideas? The law. If you mm. change the law and it's backed mm. up with the sovereignty and power of the state, which means they have to pay their tax and they have lower profit margins, they have to pay their workers more. That's a lot more powerful than an idea in abstraction. Um, but again, you know, yeah. that, that requires a certain engagement with the reality of politics and the state and the nation state in particular. I, I agree with you, I think. And also going back, and I, I would really recommend this to people watching, listening, the discussion I had with Ben Bratton on the return of the real. I think that the, t the 21st century and the various crises which will shape it will inevitably inflect a new consideration and, and self-understanding of what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that with the COVID pandemic, right? People now realise that borders aren't going to stop a pathogen, or mm -hmm. they're looking at global they're looking at global uh, data sets around deaths and new variants, and and that that quantification of the, the of, of the world as a set of biological processes is in, in forming their own interiority, which ten years ago just sounds nuts. And of course, yeah. as as climate change intensifies, we're, we're going to see more and more of that. And we will recognize the fact that we are all situated within a, within not just a global community, but a, a set of global physical, biophysical processes, which if we don't sort out, are going to have huge problems for, for, for us and, and, and subsequent generations. So I agree with you, Paolo. I think it, it's very simple to look at those crises as a Marxist, as a leftist, as a materialist, and say, of course, we're going to transcend nation states. And, and that's, a, that's a process which plays out through history. I won't mm. use the word dialectically, but it is. Because, uh, you know, because people say, well, what does that mean? Um, but at the same time, in the 21st century right now, in 2021, if you want to solve the housing crisis, if you want decisive action on climate change, if you want to ensure energy security for people, you have to work at the level of the nation state. You, ha you obviously have to. And I think, you know, I'll finish with this before I go to the next question. Um, you were talking about how people in moments of crisis see the kind of entrails of politics. And a good, a good example right now is the energy crisis in this country. Mm -hmm. And you, you saw Keir Starmer yesterday uh, saying, like I say, this isn't, uh, we're, we're, we're recording this towards the end of September before Labour Party conference. He said, you know, it's one of the, and this is, this is accurate. It's one of the priorities of the state, one of the first priorities of the state. It's almost like, you know, the rule of law is to ensure people have access to energy. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a responsibility of the state. And you think when he's saying that, you think, well, maybe we should nationalize it then. But, <laughs> but it's, but it's precisely because the market mechanism in an era of crisis can't do these things. It can't necessarily give everyone energy that all of a sudden those considerations of the nation and the nation state and sovereignty and power and control all come back. And like you say, if the left is fearful of actually talking on that terrain, we might as well not bother, you know. We might as well go sit on the beach and enjoy life and set up a direct debit to the local donkey sanctuary and just avoid politics. Um, I mean, partly, right, is, how would you say, is, is the sense of guilt of the converted, uh, a political personnel that embrace Blairism, right, therefore betrayed its uh, youth ideals. Ultimately, once you convert to something new, starting from a certain position, it's very difficult to convert back. <laughs> Uh, so I think many people, especially older people, have such a strong political and affective investment in certain ideas and in thinking that the left was wrong uh, in defending workers, that is almost impossible for them to, to come back from that. So the can, only ask thing you, we, yeah. can I ask you a question on that basis then? Yeah. Um, sorry to cut you off, but it's a really huge question for me. I wrote this piece on gerontocracy and I said that mm. ultimately, you know, the scientific, great line, scientific revolutions happen one funeral at a time. Is that mm. basically your analysis then of a lot of these people that are coming out of the political center? Those ideas will only go when that generation kind of goes, sorry to be morbid, but. No, as they say in the article, I, I wrote for a tribune on, on leadership. Um, I mean, it's really a certain age cohort. I mean, actually we had socialist grandpas, so to speak. So like uh, people in their 70s and 80s were still very uh, strongly devoted to socialism. And then obviously people in all age brackets, but say there was a dominance of a certain way of thinking uh, of boomers, I mean, of 68ers and, and, and people who were politicized in the 70s. 
who had very much this idea of, you know, the left has to change, has to embrace liberalism, people talking about liberal socialism as, as Draghi in Italy, right? I mean, always to basically justify siding with, uh, with capital and say that's the only way we, we, we can go uh, about things. Um, so that, that is why that there is so, so much staunch opposition um, from certain people, I mean, including, including Starmer. I'll just I'll come back to that point and then we'll we'll move on to the final uh, couple of questions. Um, there was a great kind of uh, uh, provocation a few years ago saying that there are no Gen X politicians who have mm -hmm. actually reached the top. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you could say Ed Miliband, of course, he lost. You could mm -hmm. say David Cameron ended in absolute catastrophe. There are no, and obviously in the US, they've still not had a Generation X president. Mm -hmm. You've you've gone from from. Um, well, I suppose there was you've had Obama, but there was not post Obama post crisis really let's say I know he comes in 2008 mm -hmm. but he comes in literally a month afterwards you you see the failure of Pete Buttigieg you see the failure of Kamala Harris and this is where the sort of discourse came from was mm -hmm. that these particular politicians that particular cohort Andy Burnham Yvette Cooper Ed mm -hmm. Balls in the UK uh were they, they grew up and they were politicized in this context of the end of history neoliberalism and now actually their, their whole ideological toolkit like I say as a cohort um is is really kaput uh, and it was an interesting idea for me, yeah. the idea that you'd basically go straight from boomers to millennials as the sort of cutting edge of political leadership. Yeah, which in a way really uh, confirms one key point, more kind of almost methodological point of the book. I mean, this idea that there are s s such a things as uh, ideological eras or ideological epochs. There is a zeitgeist, there is a spirit of the times. We are all permeated by, we are all kind of imbued with um, which means, I mean, you know, like you are very, we, all of us have been very shaped by the ideas that were dominant in a certain period, even when we fought against them, right? We were caught in, in a certain paradigm, in a certain common sense, in certain assumptions that were shared by, by many people. Uh, so these prevailing assumptions at any point in time really inflect the entire political space, right? And, and shape how people view the world, in, regardless of where they position themselves. They need to position themselves within this space that, that exists. That is why Blair's babies and some kind of Thatcher children uh, on, on the social democratic left are very difficult to, uh, to move towards a more uh, sensible agenda, really, at this point. Yeah, kind of uh, completely at odds with empiricism. Yeah. Um, last, I'm going to say last two questions, really. I, the last question is more of a sort of question about action and, and what people do going mm -hmm. forward. But the last sort of... Uh, open question is what's the role of patriotism here because mm -hmm. you talk about that in the book and of course uh, before people get worried i'm not i'm not advocating patriotism mm -hmm. uh you know before people start freaking out but obviously you're talking about the return of control you're talking about the, re mm -hmm. the, the return of protection that can either be right or left wing that can be progressive or regressive cosmopolitan or, or or bigoted um but that's gonna be a big pill for people to swallow you're saying about sort of the idea of mm -hmm. democratic patriotism which is a big part mm -hmm. of the book towards the end can you just talk about what democratic patriotism is and why you think the left should adopt it or embrace it yes i i understand that it is the most difficult piece of of the book i mean for uh, the left audience is also in, in reviews is is the part that it looks like the one that that reviewers didn't like much but I, I thought nonetheless that it was a point that was necessary to make in a way i already made it in, in previous works uh, which is, that, I mean, ultimately, I think something that is really now common sense on the left, on the U.S. left especially, right? I mean, if you look at Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, if you look at Ilan Omar, they are often reclaiming patriotism. I mean, a mm. famous tweet by Ilan Omar, I'm, I'm, when, you remember when Trump attacked the squad and said, none of you is from here, right? You're not really, really Americans. And Ilan Omar very intelligently replied to that saying, I'm patriotic, I'm a patriotic American, I'm the quintessential American, actually, because I'm a refugee who came here, built life again, and, and managed really to uh, fulfill in, in, in their own way, like the, the American dream, right? And more generally, if say philosophically, the point is that, that politics is locational right? politics as demos and topos, right? People and, and place are tied together and uh, uh, precisely because of the fact that globalism doesn't work i mean because globalism is an abstraction i mean people are defined by the place where they live in sedentary societies especially right 
and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. In fact, love for your place, love for your community, love for your, I mean, starting from the basic level, it's not just the nation, is your neighborhood, is your city, is your region, is your nation, has traditionally been seen in political philosophy by civic republican thinkers mm -hmm. as a fundamental condition for political action. Because yeah. if you don't care about your place, why should you act? I mean, not caring about your place, which is loving your place, ultimately, right? That's the meaning of patriotism. Ultimately, it leads uh, uh, to acceptance of the inevitable, like to nihilism and, and to, right, I mean, fatalism, ultimately. So um, I think on the left, people are very ready to accept certain forms of patriotism, more local. Uh, municipalism. What is municipalism, if not municipal patriotism? Like being a Londoner, loving London and wanting basically London to be your uh, the, the place you, you cherish and you want to make better. Um, so the important thing about it, I think, I mean, politically, strategically, is that patriotism can be a unifying, uh, a unifying uh, uh, element to, to build a coalition. Because in order to build a coalition, you need to speak to different interests. You need to speak to the middle class. You need to speak to people in urban areas, in rural areas. You need to speak to uh, workers in factories and office workers. But you need to unite them around something. Mm. And that something is the vision of uh, this land. I mean, even in Corbynism, ultimately, there is a lot of patriotism, right? I mean, many videos. I mean, we want, this is our country. This is where, where we live. And we love it and want to make it better. Uh, if we concede this discourse to the right, is simply going to be nationalism and saying, oh, I love my country because I don't want other people. But that is not at all the only way in which people can express their completely legitimate sense of belonging, right? Uh, and I mean, I'm, I love to be Italian uh, because I, I was born there and as anybody like loves his, his roots. And I think that is actually a resource there is a resource for the progressive politics like Can speaking I, to people pride and people sense of belonging i mean I, I i think that writing it off i think is silly and i think if you look at for instance the the marseillaise you know the, the mm -hmm. anthem of the, of the french revolution you know the, the you know the, the original republican revolution um well not the original you know you can maybe go back a bit further but you know when we talk about sort of world historical events and it talks about patrie and mm -hmm. that was that was the anthem until the Internationale, the Marseillaise, until I think maybe the, the early decades of the 19th century, so mm -hmm. maybe the 1840s even, the Marseillaise was like the anthem of the workers' movement globally. Um, so when I say globally, well, across Europe. And yeah. so I, I, I think you're obviously right, and it's obviously something that, that needs to be discussed, but I think where people would have informed misgivings, not sort of mm -hmm. liberal shallow liberal cosmopolitan misgivings which i agree with you just pointless identity politics for people mm. that you know shop at ocado but i think where there is a where there is a, a a meaningful critique is to say look you and i paolo we're doing this right now over you know ethernet with high-speed broadband led mm. lights microphone cameras computers none of this would be possible without the fruits of imperialism mm -hmm. and the fact that we have subordinated billions in the global south in an economic system which necessarily privileges the working class of the global north. And so what I'd say is, and, and of course, those, those workers in the global north are exploited as well, of course. Mm -hmm. But what I'd say is, do you not think there's a possibility where you talk about democratic patriotism? And I do, by the way, think this is a bit of a, this is a chink in the arm for the American left, I think, mm -hmm. actually, particularly the squad. Not the American mm. left, because many good American leftists on this, but people within the Democratic Party, where they don't actually have an analysis of imperialism and imperial war. And, mm. and so perhaps democratic patriotism for an Italian, although, of course, it's Italy had an empire, it had some terrible mm -hmm. moments in its history, but democratic, imperial, uh, democratic patriotism for an Italian or for a Welsh person, or particularly for an Irish person, given they were, they were colonised, they were occupied, at the, part of Ireland still is, what... Would you not say that actually, well, democratic patriotism is going to clearly mean something quite different in Britain or in England, the heartland of, of a colonial empire or the United States to what it might mean, for instance, in, say, Spain, mm. Ireland, even Italy? Yeah, of course, that in the US and the UK, that is something that is a, is a burning issue. I mean, though these countries are also now forced to reckon with 
their their past. I mean, that is in a way <laughs> their nation building is still going on as they are forced to reckon with a society. Think about the U.S. right, retreating from from Afghanistan, right, mm-hmm. embracing more uh, isolationist policies. He will need to learn to live uh, he, without at least the most uh, uh, evident form of imperialism, namely invading other countries. Mm. And therefore, we need to go to a phase of kind of national self-reflection about what the United States is, what its identity and mission is. And the same thing with, with the UK. I mean, I think the UK is still in this state of national confusion, in particular England, right? Mm. Uh, because still has not decided what it has to become after being uh, the metropolis of the empire, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously the UK, Britain and France are all, only some of the countries. There are many other countries uh, that are there that have different conditions that are now kind of weaker in the international system. But what would you say? I mean, I understand that the, the reservations come also from the disingenuous use of patriotism, uh, Starmer's uh, as uh, employed. Right, since he was elected as, as leader of the Labour Party, namely just fly the flag, uh, exactly. whatever, uh, and say that you love the army and something completely superficial and uh, completely basically conservative, embracing conservative views of, of the nation. Mm-hmm. While um, the examples I'm looking at, besides Ilan Omar or Alexander Casa Cortez, I mean, someone like, like Pablo Iglesias, right, that really speaks to the pride of Spaniards in the civil war against the fascists, uh, uh, in all their uh, efforts, uh, the working class struggles, uh, struggles for independence. Uh, and there, there is something really powerful about reclaiming people. I mean, like, like Britain, like one could speak about the Chartists, one can, one can speak about working class movements, one can speak about the efforts people made in, in the best pages of, of a nation's history. Um, is really just speaking about ultimately the a certain history, a certain history that uh, willing or willing we are all shaped by. I, I, I do totally appreciate that. And just to say, Paolo, I don't I don't necessarily disagree with mm. with your sort of conclusions. Mm. But I, I do think I do think the criticisms is valid. I think mm. what you raised there about oh well the left may have misgivings justifiably because you have people mm. like Starmer saying, I'm mm. a patriot and they mm-hmm. just point at the St. George flag and a pint of <laughs> a pint of beer is I think the big difference between saying patriotism and socialism is if you say I'm a socialist, it means you have a commitment to a set of values Mm-hmm. around around doing around doing stuff around changing yeah. stuff so if you're a socialist there's a workplace which doesn't pay people a living wage at the very least they should be paid a living wage they should join a trade union if there's a resource which everybody needs they should be able to access it regardless of ability to pay patriotism how is it a doing how is it a doing thing that's what i'm sort of <laughs> unsure about so patriotism means oh i watch the england football team i like them i like the england football team you know i've got an england football shirt uh, but i don't quite you know how's that a doing thing or, 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 and, and you talk about it in the book, and it's something we've not really touched I mean, on. But... NHS. No, but right. hold on. I mean, the, the, the yeah. Ne- yeah, but the, the necessity in politics for an enemy, yeah. which is what you talk about. And I think sometimes discourses around nationhood and patriotism mm. try to elide that. And I mm. think as a socialist, the enemy, or, you know, that there's clearly, there are contradictions in society where people have competing mm. interests. And I think sometimes discourses around sort of democratic patriotism can can obscure those now i'm not an ultra leftist which says we can never talk about the nation and Mm -hmm. you know i think for me the nation state is the primary mode of self-government so clearly we have to talk about the politics of england of course we do Mm -hmm. but i think that talking about the politics of england and then all of a sudden we get onto kind of stranger discussions around sociological englishness (laughs) i think i think that can that can be quite a strange terrain but i think to conclude i think you know, um, I remember Ash Sarka once making a really funny tweet and somebody said, you're not English. And she said, where else in the world would you have somebody who's Bengali and as mouthy as me uh, <laughs> and, 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 be, and be saying the things I'm doing and I'm saying I'm a luxury communist and be celebrated for it and, uh, and also tap into a certain, a certain I think that we, there is a certain national sense of humor in Britain. Maybe people think that's over essentializing. Tap into that and actually be be liked for it and i think for me i look at ash i think yeah ash you are you're english quintessentially could, yeah she couldn't be she couldn't maybe people are maybe going to go crazy if i said she couldn't be irish she couldn't be french she couldn't be mm. italian to me she's very english mm-hmm. in a very 21st century sense so i, I do think there's some validity there mm-hmm. absolutely but i just wonder if the political downside is is a little bigger 
and and I, I don't think oh the left shouldn't they should, the left shouldn't support the England team of the Euros because that's nationalism. I don't think that. But I, I do wonder, does it obscure, you know, the socialist content of politics? I mean, I don't think so. In a sense that is ultimately an appeal to community and to the duties all citizens, including the rich, have to community. So publicly, as you're speaking about fiscal patriotism or tax patriotism. So, so he, he joked and said, I'm sure that the millionaires and billionaires in Spain will be patriotic and, and pay their taxes. Right. It's a way to say, hey, guys, regardless of who you are, you are living here and you have some duties to the community here. So you cannot take your money abroad to tax havens and just do as if you're not part of this community because you are feeding on this community. Your wealth comes from this community, comes from this place. But it is also about an approach of saying in this phase of crisis of globalization, while for years we looked outward, this exopolitics of looking outward, now we are forced for a phase of time to look inward, to look at where we are. We need to reground in a place. We need to reground in a place and understand uh, what are the structures there, what is the landscape there, and what is the history there that we can mobilize. Um, so all these uh, politics of uh, rescuing, repaying, recovery involves an element of relocalization. And, and, and the nation now is locality in a global world is the place where uh, things can be can be built can be constructed so i mean is not uh, how would you say um, a celebration of the nation as such or a celebration of patriotism as such but saying certain forms a certain breed of patriotism namely patriotism of democratic community respect for the democratic community calls to duty to, towards community is one that is necessary to reclaim if we are to push is more a means to an end right it is a means to push in a socialist agenda. There's a great, uh, and going back, and uh, we'll, we'll finish on this broader question of, um, of, of nation and patriotism. There's a great um, sort of depiction of this in, uh, in Kikuro. I think it's, um, res uh, oh, it's in, in the Republic tra tract mm -hmm. he wrote. Was it, what is it? Is it de Res Publica? Mm -hmm. Is it Res, res Publica? Publica? Yeah. I think, okay. But where, where Scipio's dream can be found, I've not read it for years now, Paolo. I'm really showing myself, you know, <laughs> whenever you talk to Italians about this, they've all been learning Greek and Latin at school. But in, 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 in Scipio's dream, you know, he has this dream and uh, it's basically one of the sort of foundational texts of, of, of Roman Republican mm -hmm. political thought. Mm -hmm. And basically human existence, and I think this is a beautiful way of understanding politics and obligations, is a series of concentric circles. Mm -hmm. which starts with yourself, your family, your friends, your community, your town, your nation, and then goes outwards to all of humanity. And I think, and I think for, for myself, as somebody in the 21st century, as a fully automated luxury pantheist communist, <laughs> uh, I, would ex I would extend those concentric circles to, to mammals, to other species, and to our planet. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I do agree with that idea of obligation and responsibility emanating mm -hmm. outwards is a really powerful one. And I think the, the idea of the family and the nation are necessarily right wing. I agree with you on that. Uh, where, where does this account of democratic patriotism disagree, say, with Blue Labour? On a very important uh, count, namely for New Labour, I mean, we agree, I, I, or I agree with the new lab, um, Blue Labour diagnosis that the working class as to be the strategic elect is a strategic electorate that the left should uh, claim back. But Blue Labour thinks that basically you just need to adopt a conservative discourse to uh, abandon mentions of uh, rights, civil rights, LGBT rights, the defense of migrants, because of the assumption that workers are conservative, they are culturally conservative, and that mm. is why they are voting for the right, which is a complete non sequitur. Actually, workers are voting for the right because they don't feel represented by the left anymore on socio-economic issues. You know, like workers, especially in regions, in more peripheral areas, uh, also in, in the past tended to be more culturally conservative. Why? Because they lived in uh, uh, more peripheral areas. I mean, this is a, a long-term tendency. Yet they voted for social democratic parties that per perhaps were more culturally progressive than they themselves were because the socioeconomic offer of those parties was so good that they, in a way, um, whatever, uh, the, the priority for them was not cultural issues, but the priority for them was economic issues. It is obvious that when the left has nothing on offer for, for these people, 
<laughs> why should these people go go to the left? So there is a, a very uh, important difference like between people who are proposed in a kind of conservative socialism or uh, cultural conservatism. I mean, my proposal is a socialism that protects, a protective socialism. But a protection is first and foremost economic, right, and environmental, right? It is not protection of identity or is not an invitation to uh, adopt conservative motives as a kind of lurching to the right kind of, kind of strategy. Because we have tried that strategy, Starman is trying that strategy, and clearly the strategy doesn't work. It simply reinforces the frame that the right wants. Instead, we need to move the conversation towards our frame, which is a frame about economic demands, which is a frame about uh, social rights, is a frame about better wages, better working conditions, and better public services. That is how we can uh, reclaim manufacturing working class vote, right? Because the service working class is already quite solidly with the left, but we need to reclaim manufacturing working class vote. It's a great place to end it on. Thank you, Paolo. And uh, just to say, uh, the book is available, has been available for, what, a week now? Mm -hmm. uh, given that you talk about political theory, history, economics, sociology, it's very readable, I have to say. And mm -hmm. so people shouldn't, be, uh, people shouldn't be put off by the idea, oh, this is a really, you know, weighty tome. It's a really great book. Lots of, lots of nice pithy facts. Lots of suggested reading comes into it. And I think if you, if you skirt around... A lot around, of diagrams. Yeah, a lot of diagrams, very useful diagrams. Uh, often that's not the case with political sciences, but very different with yourself. Maybe it's because you're more of a sociologist. Um, so yeah, very much recommended. Paolo, thanks for joining us and I hope, I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for having me, Aaron. If you enjoyed that interview, there are two things you can do which don't cost you a thing. The first is to like it. The second thing is to subscribe to Navarra Media on YouTube. If you want to see more interviews like the one we just did with Paolo, go to navaramedia.com forward slash support and become a supporter. Help us create more articles, videos, podcasts, investigating the big questions of the 21st century. Finally, if you're watching, this is also available as a podcast. So you can subscribe to Navara on Spotify, on iTunes, and of course, don't forget to leave a review.